<clears throat> on this last example I'm going to write down, uh, let's not compute the actual area, but let's split it up into the uh, limits. So we'll do a negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, if you actually wanted to take this antiderivative and you didn't care about the endpoints, like just the antiderivative, how would you take this antiderivative? Split it up in what way? So we could, it might work to multiply them together. Maybe there's some funky inverse trig that we can use. It might be like a tangent inverse or a hyperbolic tangent inverse, something like that. Uh, what's another way without using trig functions? Usually like partial. Partial fractions. So this will split up into basically two natural logs. You have to figure out the constants, but this could split into partial fractions as well. So I'm not going to worry about actually taking the antiderivative. I just want to make it not improper anymore. So I want to deal with the positive and negative infinity. There's also two vertical asymptotes. And they're both inside the interval, because I did the interval all the way from negative infinity to positive infinity. So if we are going to split this up, and I'll let, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to keep rewriting this expression, so we'll just call it f of x. So step one, let's deal with the uh, negative infinity, positive infinity endpoints of the interval. <clears throat> so I could go so my asymptotes are 2 uh, negative 1 and positive 2 and of course the other uh, place I have to break it up is negative infinity and positive infinity now when we break this up I can't just break it into that interval because I will have a limit on both sides of it. I'll have an asymptote, a vertical asymptote limit at negative 1, and I'll have a limit on negative infinity. So unfortunately, I have to go and break it up. I have to pick some more x values to break it up on. The same is true. So this interval, I can't use that interval, the full one. I can't go vertical asymptote to vertical asymptote. So each of these intervals needs to be cut in half. Or we're going to have 6. So what is a good x value between negative infinity and negative 1? Negative 2. Let's go negative 2. I'm just picking basically the easiest integer, the smallest integer that I can inside there. So we're going to pick negative 2. What's a good number between negative 1 and positive 2? 0. When in doubt, you always want to use 0. And then what about between 2 and infinity? 3. All right, so we're going to have six intervals now. <clears throat> so I'm going to just write it as integral of f, so I don't have to keep writing that 1 over x minus 2 times x plus 1. I don't want to keep rewriting that thing. So first, we got a limit. I'll just go alphabetically. A approaches, oh, you know what? Let's not do limits on the first step. Let's just write out the six integrals. We'll go minus infinity to minus 2 plus minus 2 to minus 1 plus 2 to minus 1 minus 1 to 0 plus 0 to 2 plus 2 to 3 plus 3 to infinity. All right, so there's all six, and each one of them is going to get a limit. We just have to pick the correct endpoint, and for the vertical asymptotes, we have to decide left or right. So you can either follow along what I write or just write it out yourself. And don't use the letters x, d, or f when you're picking your variable names. 
because those are already in use. Alright, so I use the letters A and J for the infinity, negative infinity. And <clears throat> I use B and C for the uh, vertical asymptote at negative 1. And then I use G and H for the vertical asymptote at 2. You can see, let's see. So there's the vertical asymptote at 2. If you group those two together, group those two together, that's a vertical asymptote at negative one. So this is how you would split it up. It's gonna take a long time to compute all these, so individually these are not difficult integrals to do. They'll both turn into some natural logs and you just decide what those limits are. All right, any questions on this breakdown into six separate integrals? I promise you on your final exam, you won't have to break something into six pieces. That's a little bit ridiculous. The other examples we did, I think are more reasonable for a uh, quiz or uh, final exam question. Like going <clears throat> on this one here, the negative infinity to infinity with no vertical asymptotes. Or we did one, we went from zero to infinity with a vertical asymptote, a single one side of a vertical asymptote and an infinite limit. I think those are reasonable. So this is the end of improper integrals. You just have to do some practice now. And we're going to move into chapter 10. All right, sequences, you have seen sequences a little bit before, and we're going to look at them way more closely now. So we'll start with the definition. All right, most of you have 
taken some high school English classes, and so you could probably define sequence in English. Anybody want to be brave? A sequence? So it's basically whatever he just said. An order, some type of uh, grouping of things, but it has an order, right? It says this is first, this is second, this is third. So that's pretty much what it means in math, except we're gonna the things we're gonna look at are numbers. So this will be a list of numbers. Oh. An order list of numbers that is important. Order list of numbers. Uh, sure. Talk to me after class. Yeah. All right. So, an ordered list of numbers, and uh, <clears throat> you can have finite or infinite. So, the only difference between finite means there's a finite number of terms. Infinite means you start somewhere and it goes forever. And another uh, definition we need is a factorial. So factorial, it's written with an exclamation point. And the definition of n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down times 1. What happens if I did times 0? What would every factorial be? Zero. 0. So that would not be very exciting. So we'll stop it at 1. So, uh, <clears throat> And this is for any positive integer n. So write that as any n in z plus. So we'll compute a few of these factorials. Uh, 0 factorial does not fit the pattern. Because zero factorial would be would not fit the pattern at all. So zero factorial is defined to be one. One factorial is kind of boring. It's just the one right there. Two factorial, two times one, which is two. Three factorial. You could write it as three times two times one, or you can regroup it so it is three times two factorial. So remember, two factorials are two times one. And this is six. Four factorial, I'm going to save some ink right now and write it as four times three factorial. So instead of writing three times two times one, we'll just write it as four times three factorial. We know three factorial from above is six, and four times six is 24. It is a product of integers less than or equal to that number. Um, it's going to come into play when you take successive derivatives of polynomials. For example, you'll be multiplying by decreasing powers, basically. So it shows up if you're taking like the eighth derivative of an eighth degree polynomial. You'd multiply by like eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, like that. All right, so go ahead and get the next three factorials, five factorials, six factorial, and seven factorial. And don't multiply five times four times three times two times one. Just do five times four factorial. You already got four factorial. So compute these right now.
They're the factorial of the line right above it. So that six goes right there. It's it's the it's the three factorial basically. So I'm writing fact I'm defining them recursively, meaning I'm defining them based off the one that came before. Gotcha. Instead of multiplying those numbers out all over again, I already did that work. Uh, because it works out nicely in computations, it does not fit the pattern, so it's basically arbitrarily chosen, but it's chosen as this number because it's the most useful. Uh, <clears throat> there is a generalized factorial, it's called the gamma function. So you can look at the gamma function, but I believe it uses complex integration, which we will cover in, what is that class I'm blanking on? Differential equations. So we'll look more carefully at the gamma function in differential equations. So it'll be defined, it's actually defined for all, I believe all real numbers. Uh, but it gets quite ugly for non-positive integers. 50-40? All right. You could, of course, keep going, but at some point, it's going to become too tedious to do by hand. But I do want you to pay attention to at least the first six factorials, because you may see the number progression 6, 24, 1, 20, 7, 20, and now you'll know you're looking at a factorial as opposed to some other pattern. All right, those are factorials. Let's write out the first. <coughs> oh, so this will be sequence notation. So we use the curly brackets for sequences. So the first term, we'll usually start them at 0 or 1. So I'll just start this one right at 0. So the first term will be a0. Second term, a1, a2, dot, 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 up to a n. So it's just a convenient way to list out lots of terms, as long as they follow some pattern that you can write down. And if n is infinity, obviously, it would just go dot, dot, dot. There would be no last term. So if you see infinity up there, which I'll write now, so if you go ak, k equals 0 to infinity, that's a0, comma, a1, comma, a2, dot, dot, dot. And just remember that dot, dot, dot means continue the pattern. So there should be a pattern, and just keep going. You generally need three to establish a pattern. So I usually try to write three terms, unless the pattern is painfully obvious. These ones, you could probably just write two, a0, a1, dot, dot, dot. And it should be pretty clear what comes next. It's not OK to just write a0, comma, dot, dot, dot. That's not enough to establish a pattern. For all I know, it's followed by a bunch more a zeros. So our first example, write out the first four terms. Uh, no, there. So what you may see, actually, I'll throw a factorial into this next example. Yeah, so we'll look at sequences that have patterns. Okay. Uh, so I want you to write out the terms of these sequences. The first one, we'll do negative 1 to the k times 1 over k factorial. And we'll go k equals 0 to 4. So it looks like there's four terms, but as you write the terms out, you'll find that there's not four terms. So I'll write the first term out. Negative 1 to the 0, 1 over 0 factorial. And when I reduce this down, 0 factorial is 1. Negative 1 to the 0 is also 1. So our first term will just be 1 right here. 
So the second term, negative 1 to the first, 1 over 1 factorial. And go ahead and write the next terms until you get to the last term, where you got 4 as your last uh, k value. And then simplify them down on the next line. We're so our last term will be 4. Okay. Will be k equals 4. Right. But that doesn't mean there's 4 terms. So on this, you're using the initial and the final value. Okay. So whatever it looks like, it looks like there should be 4 terms. But because you're starting and ending on terms, you actually get an extra term than what it looks like. Okay. So if you did 4 minus 0, obviously that's 4, but there's 5 terms because you start, you count the first and the last term. Um, usually when we count, if you say like, you know, how many days until tomorrow? We don't say today's one and tomorrow's two, so two days. But here you're counting like that. So is it the interval from k equals zero to k equals four? Well, it's not quite What's the interval mean? because it's only the integer values from there, not okay. all the real numbers between zero and four. So, but is four the k equals four, or is it the, the total? Yeah. So. Okay. That's your final so you k could, value. Yeah, you could write k equals zero and k equals four if you want, but usually people are lazy and don't okay. write the k equals. Just like in integrals, you don't usually write x equals x equals. However, sometimes that's very helpful. So you can absolutely do that. All right, so you should have gotten 1, negative 1, 1 half, negative 1 half, negative 1 sixth, positive 1 24th. So <clears throat> you can see the factorial pattern in the denominator, except you don't really see it so much on the first two. What does the negative 1 to the k power do? Alternates sign. So that alternates signs. goes positive, negative, positive, negative. If it was a... Uh, k plus 1, it would have gone negative positive, negative positive. But either way, that negative 1 to a power is going to alternate signs. So write that down. So anytime you see negative 1 to the k, it's going to alternate signs. Occasionally, you may see cos of pi k. This also alternates signs. What is cosine of 0? One. 1. What's cosine of pi? Negative 1. Negative one. What's cosine of 2 pi? Negative. Positive 1. So this basically loops around the unit circle, going positive, negative, positive, negative. So this is another way to do alternating signs. Usually, you'll see minus 1 to the k. It's easier to write down, a little easier to think about. <coughs> you could do it with really any trig function if you want to be uh, if you want to exhaust all possibilities, but I'm not going to write the other ones out. I think there's plenty of tangent uh, angles that give you 1 or negative 1. You just have to be more careful with how you pick them. All right, our next example. What we're going to do next is start with terms and then write the sequence. Yep, right out the terms. So that's all we were doing. All right. Now, that your surprise is probably because this question is too easy to put on a midterm or a quiz. I totally agree. 
It's a trivial question, so you will not see this on a quiz. You may see it on one homework a problem or two, but it's not going to show up on your uh, quiz. Yes, there is. <laughs> now, <coughs> if you were in uh, middle school, I think this would be a reasonable question to put on your quiz. <laughs> So this is the inverse question where I'm going to give you terms and then ask you to uh, write it in that curly bracket sequence notation. So first thing we have to do is notice the pattern. You really only need to look at three terms to see a pattern. So I could see it off the first three terms. I don't really need that seven in there. So what pattern do you see? Add three. Add three. So plus three, plus three, plus three. So I'll write that down. So we go to the next term. We go plus three, plus three, plus three. All right, what type of a function, if you move over one, goes up by three every time? Linear. Linear. Slope of three. So slope of three is basically what we need. So let's think about what that would look like. <clears throat> our input, our variable name is k. So this linear function will look like 3k plus some initial offset right there. So if I go over one, I want to go up three, and that's exactly what that slope three will, will do for me. Now we have to decide where do we want to start. When in doubt, I like to go with starting at zero. So I'm just going to start this at zero. What does that mean B should be? So I'm going to write my initial term will be three times zero plus B better equal negative two. So I see my initial term is negative two, just using that formula right there, and my k equals zero starting value. So I combined what I had, and so B is negative two. So I'll go and fill that in. Three k minus two, k equals zero. Now I have to fill in the final value. It's definitely not infinity, because it stops at 100. So it's not going to go all the way. So let's do final term now. So 3 times some k value minus 2 needs to equal 100. Uh oh, did I pick a bad end value? I think I did. No, I think this will work. All right, good. I just made this problem up. I'm glad it'll work out. All right, so tell me what k is. Thirty-four. Thirty-four. Two. Seems right. Thirty-four. Mm -hmm. Does the sequence notation is it always going to start at zero? No, I could start it at at one. Would have been reasonable. Uh, maybe you can start it at like 17 if you feel like it, or 42. So if you change if, that, would that just change your B value? Yep, that would change my B quite a bit, yeah. So if I started at 42, obviously B would be a pretty significant negative number to compensate for that huge value I would get off the 3K. So you can get multiple answers. Correct. But your K and B just have to be in correct sequence. Yes. Um, but you can pick whatever K you want. So let's go ahead and re-index this right now. So let's go ahead and write it at uh, starting at k equals 0 instead of uh, k equals 1. So what I just did is I took k and shifted it up by 1. So what would my final k value be? It wouldn't be 34 anymore. It would be 35. So I need the same number of terms. So if I begin one higher, i got to end one higher. Now the tricky part. I have to compensate in here. So here's the way I think about it. When k equals 0, that should be 0. So I need 3 times something minus 2 
so that when I plug in one, I get zero here. So I need k uh, minus one. The other way to think about it is I'm increasing k, so I have to compensate inside and decrease k so that it doesn't change my initial term. So if I don't do that compensation with the minus one, I'm not gonna have the exact, I'm not gonna have the same starting term. My sequence will basically be shifted. And you can do algebra, of course. So this is 3k minus 3 minus 2, so 3k minus 5. So we got 3k minus 5 from k equals 1 to 35. And it's a good thing to do. Just check your initial term and see what you get. When k equals 1, we got 3 minus 5, which is negative 2. So you can always recheck when you re-index, just your first term. All right, so that is re-indexing right there. This is what we call arithmetic. And that means you're going to add a constant value to get the next term. We'll do the next series or next sequence. So is this sequence going to be finite or infinite? infinite? Infinite. So there's no end value. Infinite, in some sense, is easier to write down because you don't have to compute your last uh, k value. Uh, it's also infinitely difficult to think about because we can't really think about infinity. Like we talked about that briefly yesterday, where we had an infinite width, yet an area was finite. So your intuition basically breaks down when it comes to infinity. Uh, <coughs> What pattern is happening? Alternating signs and multiplying by fourth. So multiply by fourth and alternating signs. Can I do both at the same time? What if I multiply by negative one fourth? That will change from negative to positive, positive to negative, and take care of the multiplying by one fourth as well. And does that work on the next one? Hopefully. Looks like it does. All right. What in the world is this one going to look like? So this will be very incorrect. Negative 1 fourth k. That would be basically subtracting a fourth every time. That's not what I want to do. It's actually going to look kind of similar. You raise it to the k power. So this means when k goes up by 1, what happens here? If you think of negative one fourth to the k plus one, that is negative one fourth times negative one fourth to the k. So that's the reason that uh, this exponential multiplies by an additional negative one fourth when you increase by one, right there. So that's the reason why it works out like this. All right, let's go ahead and. Let's see if we can get this to work out. Is there a k value that can go here at the beginning? Let's make an equation. So let's do an equation like we did last time. Uh, one, one, negative one fourth of the k equals two. Uh, I think the 
the best we can do is a log's kind of scary because that's negative. You can move the base. We can't use a log here. Wait, so can you just set A equal to zero and find out what your like offset should be? We can try that. If you set A equal to zero, you just get one. So then you get one to do it, it'd be a plus one. So we can try that. Let's go negative one fourth to the k plus one. Yeah. We'll try that. All right, what's gonna happen when k gets really big? You're gonna have a tiny number plus one. So it's gonna be numbers that are very close to one as our sequence progresses. So let's try multiplying by something. So I'll just write an a here, and I'm going to start at zero. So let's see if we can figure out what number a goes in front. All this stuff didn't work out so well. Just get that out of there. All right, and k is zero. So what does a have to equal? a equals two. So let's go ahead and ch oh no, let's go ahead and check this out. All right, test out. Let's do the first two terms. Write down the zero term and the one term and see if we're on the right track. And we'll go for the third term also, just to be sure. So we got positive an eighth for our third term. All right, this one should work. And of course, we're going to infinity. So we don't have to compute anything for that. You just write the infinity up there. So there is our sequence. Yeah, I'm showing you that like the two basic types are arithmetic, and this is called a geometric right here. So this is a geometric sequence. It means you multiply by. Um, <coughs> they usually use the letter R to uh, get the next term. Whereas arithmetic, you added some amount to get the next term. Yeah, I don't know what to do about that. Much better. <laughs> All right, we could look at a slight change in notation. So we're writing it as a with a subscript k. You could just as well write it as a function, like a as a function of k instead of a with a subscript. So you can write them in function notation as well. So feel free to write either way. And now we're gonna look at convergence.
So this will be convergence of sequences. It only makes sense, convergence only makes sense if you have an infinite number of terms. If you have a finite number of terms, well, you'll get, you can see how close you are to different numbers, but you'll never get arbitrarily close. Uh, but with infinite sequence, so this is only for infinite sequences. So the sequence converges to L if lim n approaches infinity, or so we can just use k approaches infinity, a k equals L. So the idea of convergence of a sequence means the terms get closer and closer to some number L. So on the next example, we're going to determine does a sequence converge or does it diverge? So it diverges if it does not converge. Uh, well, you can write, yeah, you can take the limit of the, of the terms, basically. It works just like a limit of a function. If it's going to get close to something. So if we go back and look at these sequences we had, uh, here is, here's our geometric. This one went on forever. Is it going to get close to a value? It's getting close to zero, right? It's going to go, I mean, it goes positive, negative, but every time you move over, it actually gets closer to zero. So this one will converge to zero. And if we look above, obviously, if I want to talk about convergence, I have to make sure it goes on forever. So I'll just ignore that 100 at the end. Is this one going to converge? Is there one number that these are getting closer to? So they are going to infinity, but that's not a number. So this one will be diverging to infinity. I don't know, did we do one? Oh, we did, well, we wrote out some terms. This one, what does it look like is happening here? Close to zero on this guy. So they are jumping signs plus minus, but they're getting closer to zero. Uh, no, you can have them, uh, actually that, that first one had a factorial which I guess you could say is multiplication, a multiplicative pattern, but slightly different than a geometric pattern. Will they ever approach a number other than zero? Oh, they can definitely approach a number other than zero, yeah. Basically, if I added like five to all those terms, they would be approaching five instead of approaching zero. Oh, All right, so first one, determine convergence or divergence. A k is just going to be 4 minus 2 to the k. So all you have to do to determine convergence or divergence, take a limb as k gets really big, k approaches infinity, of 4 minus 2 to the k. So is this limit, does this limit have a numerical value or does it not? Correct. Yeah. So it could be infinity. Divergence could mean it can diverge to infinity or negative infinity or doesn't converge to any single value. It just keeps jumping around. So this one would be 4 minus infinity, which is minus infinity. And that's not a number. So this one will diverge.
vibrations? Yeah, it's the same word. It is. He was thinking about the movie. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about movies. I mean, I'm from right next to Hollywood, but I don't, I'm not into it. Oh, I got a question about